Tak, ja też tutaj jest dużo takich. Okay, there are quite a few, uh, quite a few journeys in time. I couldn't resist using these sort of slides at the very beginning. Of course, the first thing we saw was the downfall of the communist system, and we could say that that meant, it seemed to a lot of us, is, was that it's all over now. This looks like uh, we won the war, but we didn't. This is China joining the world uh, economy and the wealth and uh, being uh, um, um, an obedient producer, manufacturer of whatever we want produced. And now this is the EU and the Maastricht contract that was signed in 1992. It seems that the EU has been forever, but it's only since the 1990s when it started for real. We can say also there was the, this was 30 years of unbelievable prosperity. Huge money was made. You could say that the last 30 years uh, was was Elysium, practically speaking, especially for us in Poland. From slaves we became free, from poor we became almost rich. But when we look at uh, some of the axioms that seemed to be absolutely true, war is no option. It was not, especially in Europe. Life uh, is getting better. It was getting better. We didn't fight for things. We, we traded things. There was quite a lot of money. Prices were low. Inflation was non-existent. Climate change, especially in the 90s, was, uh, for many of us, was just ideology, something unusual. And this is the first graph that I wanted to, to turn your attention to. First of all, it's 500, a span of 500 years, probably the oldest graph ever shown. But what we wanted to, to calculate was how many world powers were in conflict. And we can draw a conclusion that peace is a rare commodity. And we had times when everyone was fighting everyone for everything. When we look at the graph, you will see it is just the last several dozen years that is an unprecedented time when there was no war was between world powers, but we probably see the end of that period. I remember when Russian soldiers, when Soviet soldiers were, were leaving Poland. Now we have soldiers back in Poland. And it seems that we're all getting used to the thought that war is beginning to play the role of a political tool. There's no politician who will say loudly that they won't go to war. On the contrary, there are those that say, if we want to uh, defend ourselves, we'll go to war, because all wars are wars of defense, obviously. Usually, they, they would, uh, those politicians would never go to that war personally. There was a lot about this subject now. I primarily wanted to say something different here, but my predecessor picked up a lot of what I was going to say. We didn't consult the, the areas that we'll cover. I'll just say this. Basically, we didn't do our homework in those areas. Gas, oil, coal. We can somehow excuse those choices, that the Russian kilowatt of energy that we bought this is what Alicia de Fratyka talked about, would then end up in a chair that was produced in Poland, and that kilowatt would then become twice as expensive. Then it would go into a German car, more expensive there, and we developed soft power based on that. And to an extent, we developed based on added value, which was based on raw materials produced in Russia, and Europe made money from it. At some point, in connection with greater globalization, by the way, I, I, I drove a German car for a few years, which was produced in Argentina, powered by Russian fuel. And we had uh, completely normal, perfectly normal. Even some of us did something uh, like this in a recent week, where we bought uh, a juice from 
Gruyets apples, but from a Russian-made glass, which we bought in a Swedish shop that I personally bought from uh, uh, with money from a French bank that paid my salary. So, in real terms, we are all always complaining. We're saying that something happened unexpectedly, and I'm thinking. Us, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, didn't we know who we're dealing with when we're trading? We did. We did very well. We knew who they were. If we didn't warn Europe or our warnings were not heard, why didn't we get prepared ourselves if we knew that we're really making deals with the devil? And this is a question I have no answer to. I hope this is something that we'll learn from. When we talk about the state, I grew up, let's call it grew up, I, I entered adult life in the 1990s. And the views that you can read here on this slide at that time were very popular. The state was going to become a night watchman. Basically, everybody agreed about that. Less state. We all thought that the less state, the better. And it's worth adding, or maybe pay focusing on the fact that even in this area, politicians seem to be very clever because it's the only professional group that convinced us that the less the politicians work, the better they are as professional. It somehow never works for other professions. We very quickly found out that it was not as good as it seemed. There were things so big that they couldn't be done with the use of civic society or free market economy. In a very spectacular way, you could, uh, you could describe it as a disaster cannot be privatized. These sort of things have to be resolved by the states. States are something that we need, and we are not convinced that we, we, we did a f even a few years ago. Definitely we should keep in mind, and uh, I'll be talking about somebody really nasty, but it's somebody that characterized very well the approach of politicians and people in power that once you get power, we never give it back. So that's the quotation. So we should expect that if politicians gain more authority and more rights, they will not so easily give up on them. This is also a graph that shows you who contributed how much. Poland was a bit of a problem because uh, we have uh, an increasing problem with data credibility or data reliability. We tried to check it almost as late as as late as late uh, this morning. We estimated that it was approximately 10%, but Poland is not in the gra graph because our data is not reliable. But it's about 10% approximately. Now, that's another interesting thing that in the scale of world history was a complete and total anomaly. You can see the uh, interest rates uh, and how they changed. This is the cost of money in different locations geographically. At some point, they reached a level where money cost nothing. Interest rates in a central bank was zero. And if we go back even to the times when there was uh, uh, bullion-based uh, money or money that was exchangeable to gold, we never had that situation. The statistics in the world uh, today, available today, where you can read, especially the English have such such uh, documentaries going going back that long. What was the interest rates for money? They've had the the, the data for 300 years back. They never had that. It was based on gold, etc. And yet the money always cost to borrow. Here it cost nothing. Now it turned out that uh, it's not only money that was cheap. Everything everywhere 
started becoming cheaper and cheaper. For me, because as I said, I started my professional life in the 1990s, the first loan I gave, I, I worked at a corporate bank at that, uh, sorry, a cooperative bank at that time. So the customers, VIP customers for us were members of the cooperative and the, the loan was uh, at 50% interest. So those who were not members of the co-op, it was 55%. I hope nearing my retirement, I will not be granting such loans. But what was unusual for us is this little tooth on the right-hand side. This is a period of deflation in Poland, which for me uh, seemed completely impossible ever. If we look at inflation, Poland is a little bit of an extreme uh, uh, rider. On the one hand side, we had absolutely, totally the largest inflation, and then we were the only country in Europe which had deflation. It's really difficult to think what might happen next. This next graph, again, a lot was said about this, it's consumer prices. I don't know if this graph is very readable, but I try to describe it. It shows inflation in terms of consumer components of consumer spending. Generally, earlier on, inflation would most often uh, be caused by a strong pressure by one or from one, two or three factors. Here, we can suddenly see that there's everything. It's like the prices went to attack in line. Everything is getting more expensive. I'll go back to what Alicia de Frateca said earlier during the panel. This is not just an inflation. It's a beast that will be extremely difficult to rein. When everything becomes more expensive, the whole uh, economy would have to become low energy, low emissions, and so on and so forth. And I'm afraid that we will have a significant problem with achieving that. I, I have to be a little self-critical about this next thing, which is climate. In the 1990s, I definitely thought, whenever I saw someone on te television who chained themselves to a, a smokestack or to a tree, I would rather consider the artistic side of their performance rather than look at what they were saying. All of those uh, sea-borne pontoons next to oil rigs and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, they had those banners, they were shouting something, and uh, at the end of the day, when we look at what's happening now, it turns out that we had better listened to them. <laughs> yeah, we should have. This first graph, the one on the right-hand side, it's quite popular, uh, of various uh, variants of it, and it shows that there's no discussion. These are facts. Facts are, are, are a dictatorship. The, the more CO2, that's the one on the left, the more the highest temperature. It's not a simulation. This is measurements. So, if what we see on the right hand side is true, and it must be true, then the thing from the thing on the left, we can predict the future very well. The blue areas, of course, this is a simulation of what happens if we don't change anything. But it seems that it would be good if we did change something. If we don't, looking at the map of Poland, we have to build a seaport in Gorzów, and in Gdańsk you have to enjoy while you still have the city, because uh, in this simulation it will go, the Hell Peninsula will be gone as well. Next topic is globalization. Um, the legend disappeared from the graph, but I'll describe it generally. These are graphs which tells us how much, how many people are transported uh, by air. Uh, containers is the next line, 
and, and mass transit is the next. What you can see, uh, this is growing on average approximately three times since the year 2000, so 300% in 20 years. And the question is, is it a lot? Now, this is another measure which is probably more intuitive. 61% of the world, of the global GDP, is tradable internationally. So situations where you have a bottle from one continent, bottle top from another, and the beverage from a third continent, and it did happen with one of our clients, that's perfectly normal. 60% of what we produced was moving between continents all the time. And we have to remember that in this statistic, international statistic, uh, internal EU trade is not included. It's considered, EU is considered to be one business system, one economic system. If we look from the perspective of small countries, at, so for instance, what's happening in the US between the states, the level of movement of goods is even higher. We're back uh, to discuss food and the prices. Grzegorz has shown um, what the prices, how the prices of food were changing in the last two years. That's why I'm ending this in on year 2020, so we don't have any conflicts with one graph and the other. But we could say that the 10 to 12 recent years was predict so predictable it was it was boring the basic parameters where we look at grain prices they were fluctuating at the level of two three percent per year you could probably very precisely predict uh, what's going to happen the following year or in the following years and this is the result of what happened, the attack of Russia on Ukraine. And again, the data that we have, we couldn't fit the, the, the graph here, but the index has been calculated since the 1950s. Once again, we never had such high, high prices of food. In Poland, it, it was considered, the grandmother was saying that she, when she bought sugar because uh, uh, nuclear war was expected because of the Cuban crisis, it appears that the world was more upset about Yom Kippur war rather than the Cuban crisis. These prices are at real prices, are absolutely at the highest uh, historical level. Moreover, the prices are highly volatile. In the, in the initial months of the war in Ukraine, and Grzegorz showed that very well on the graph, two sentences of a single politician resulted with prices on the world market, including food prices, going up or down uh, a few percent. What we saw there was quite symbolic. I don't remember. It was the 20th of February. It was right after the war started when the grain price went 10% up one day and almost 10% down another day. And then it went back up again. The fluctuation, the electric nature of the price changes is something that we've never experienced before. We're coming back uh, to how a business was seeing itself. We wanted to have as little government as possible and as much business as possible. Most of you, if you didn't even learn this, you heard about the five forces, Porter's five forces that affected the economic world. They did not predict anything else. Business was an independent galaxy with its own start. Star, uh, Porter's name, and that was everything that we considered. And then reality told us call, and the call came from several uh, directions. It turned out all the PhDs that had been written, it turned out that uh, what we had that we considered to be knowledge was really faith rather than knowledge. And the world really looks different than we thought. And let's look at what life was like. The red line on the graph is Poland. 
This is also a graph that shows the incredible success that we achieved in the uh, recent 15 years. That is uh, since we, uh, since our accession to the EU. I remember my statistics classes at university. I had a professor that was saying, "How fast are we going to catch up with EU average?" And the calculation showed never. It turned out that uh, we, 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 it's possible. We're not at the level as of Germany or France yet, but some of the smallest or let's say poorest EU countries we've caught up with. In his opinion, achieving the level of Spain or Portugal was impossible unless you went to a galaxy far away. So we really exceeded the expectations statistically. Romania, Lithuania were doing a little better, but it seems quite impressive, especially that we had a bit of a slow start and it was a little later that we started doing well. If we look at this now, this is a type of test that measures fear. We see that Polish consumers really strongly appreciate what's been happening recently. This is really a graph which is a kind of hybrid, depression cross, crossed with pessimism. On the uh, vertical axis, we have uh, um, the answer to the question, do you think it's going to get worse? On the horizontal axis, the it's answer to the question, do you think it used to be better? So apart from the fact that, that the heroes of the recent game are in stark opposition, you can clearly see that Poles are among the most pessimistic or pessimistically minded people in Europe. Almost half of the people in Poland believe that good times are over. When we look at the other countries, maybe we are a little, a little hysterical, but probably n nobody believes that things are going to get better. This is just the scale of how scared we are about the future. And uh, this shows that people mostly look at uh, the future as, as bleak. This is strong enough that it can become powerful as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, this is economic strength. I like these graphs because what they show is that the bigger the rectangle, the bigger the economic power of the country. This is the GDP of a country. And we see that the third uh, country in the world is Japan, the fourth, Germany. These are not very large countries at all. When we look at Russia, we marked it in red. It's not very big. Next to it is Korea. Poland is dark blue under Taiwan. We're not that small globally. We're bigger in Europe than Sweden and Belgium. It shows that uh, the success can also be measured in terms of the weight that we carry economically. I also like to add that Poland is number 21, 22 globally in terms of economic strength. This is not bad at all. But when we look uh, and you remember the news that you heard or that you read uh, the day before yesterday, that international section does not sound, I mean, this graph is not even visible. What is visible is this. This is the declarative number of nuclear warheads that the various countries have. The several months of the war shows that it's not necessarily everything that Russian, the Russians have works. They have it, they probably, they say they have it, they probably have it, but we don't know if it works, but they have a lot of it. Mm, clearly, m more important is the simple statement that in this map or in this graph, you can't see Germany or Japan or Korea. And when you think about the dialogue, because I read the international uh, part of the news, especially the Japanese and the Koreans never say anything until the U.S. expresses an opinion on what the world uh, or, the, or what the political order in Asia should be. The soft power that been, we'd been building for 30 years at this point in time, when 
key decisions are made, let's say sitting down to, to a table where well decisions are made, is practically reserved for these states, which explains why the Prime Minister of India could publicly scold Putin and it did not uh, result in any repercussions. It's just that everyone at this table is, seems to be more or less equal. The number of the numbers of warheads up to Israel, everyone has over 100. You can really cause significant damage. And now, I mixed things up uh, so much. Uh, the question is, what's going to happen? In my opinion, what's going to happen is that we will be in in a war situation, war between great powers. And let's be frank, it's not a war between Ukraine and Russia. It's a war between the West, that is the US, and Russia, with China standing in line. So the, the, the stretching of the muscles in Asia is, is uh, gaining on impetus. So we have to appreciate that wars are back and they will continue. Unfortunately, at least short term, in a few years, maybe 10 years uh, perspective, it's going to lead us to neglects of nature and we're going to feel that later on. We very frequently hear things, uh, let's not talk about emissions, that's unimportant. Yeah, it'll turn out later if it's unimportant. I, I personally think that's actually the most important thing right now. But people in those situations, uh, I mean, in this situation, there's no way people are going to be happier. They're going to be less happy. We're going to be poorer. We'll have less money in our wallets. And those wallets are going to be more difficult to fill in because we're starting to f we'll be starting to feel the cost of money. And what's in the wallet will be disappearing very quickly or will be losing value because inflation is going to be taking its toll. There's no such thing as a global village. We thought there was. Oh, we were global. Uh, we all belong to the same community. Uh, the world, global world has just fallen apart into bits and pieces. My predecessors were making such allusions. Let me make some allusions. We're most probably uh, be forced and willing to create uh, clusters of trust. So generally what's very important to be is to belong somewhere. Best of all, to belong to such a cluster or group or a band which is winning. In the case of Poland, because I was brought up in Warsaw, but on the right bank, Praga, the, the bad side of the river, and not Zolibosz on the left bank. And before you went to school, by age seven, you could find out that you have to belong to a, to a gang because you're not a gang member. You're either beaten by everybody or you, you stay at home. I want us to, to choose a good group. Otherwise, we'll never cope. No way. There's no country that can cope independently, with the exception, perhaps, of the US, that could cope alone. Most certainly, there will also be more politics. I don't know if our politicians are ready for more politics. It seems that the politicians that we've had at the end of the 80s and the early 90s were, if not more mature, more concerned with doing their job and perhaps technically better prepared for their respective functions. They had more learning. They, they invited uh, the academia to, to take part in politics. Current politicians are more uh, associated with m marketing. Uh, but there will be more uh, politics, that's for sure. And I think in the previous um, interventions you could hear there is going to be considerable developments, there are going to be considerable developments in technology. We, we can't tell where exactly, in which areas of technology, but all of our civilizational development, uh, luckily, maybe, is based on technology. It started with uh, grabbing a piece of stone or a piece of bone in our hand. Now we're planning space flights going to other planets. Technology, I'm counting on it, will come to the rescue.
And what will our world be, uh, the food and agro world? Most certainly it will be expensive. It seems that the graph that we've shown you could be, uh, has got some peaks where we showed that the reference point was the Yom Kippur uh, war. But in uh, my opinion, if we do not consider the, uh, the perspective of a few years back or a, one year back by looking medium term, there's no point, there's no chance it's going to be cheaper. We have less arable area, we will have to produce more food because the population of the world is on the increase and the production, as my predecessors indicate, is going to have to be done in such a way that we stop causing damage and best of all, help, help to, to make the climate or the environment reasonably bearable for our children and grandchildren. For that reason also I'd mentioned that there are going to be regulations, regulations and more regulations because we're going to be living in the world where there will be less and less of everything, especially in terms of natural resources and we'll be looking uh, at each other's hands. We have, we'll need more transparency, there will be more regulations, there are more checking whether the things that we uh, have is, is well used. And here we have a certain beacon of hope. In this business, we are going to have new area for making money. I'm talking here about the management of the emissions or agriculture that can consume carbon dioxide. This is a business we cannot assess yet at this moment, but we will have enormous amounts of money uh, in this business. Uh, this is what Agnieszka was talking about during the discussion panel. We can see already that the speculative money or investment long-term resources are looking for possibilities. So this inflow uh, is already there into the sector. This is not within the sector. This is the money that comes totally from outside to make money to invest. The reasons uh, for that are numerous. Some people look for some uh, peace, some for some development uh, changes. There are a lot of answers to the challenges that we are facing these, these days. So, are we going to cope with it? And again, this graph shows uh, here, the, uh, the data, the statistics uh, is not attractive. This is uh, uh, science with um, rather unfavorable PR. Nobody, uh, uh, we don't want really to read that correctly, so not to um, talk about it uh, for too long, we will manage, because we managed before. So in food and agro, it was much better than uh, the rest of Europe or the rest of the world. And uh, going towards the summary, we have a number of quotes from America, from the military sector. I wanted to say that um, everybody knows something. So going into this room, you knew something. You had some knowledge. I believe that we have shown, or we try to define that there are issues we know we don't know, and a lot of what we discussed can match this definition. But I believe that the future refers to the other part. We don't know what we don't know, so this is going to be the future. 
So we need to refer back to Professor Bartoszewski saying that if you don't know how to behave, be polite and be cautious. Well, this politeness in uh, our everyday life, but cautious approach in business economic life. This is what our uh, predecessors was talking, were talking about. So put the heat a little bit down, uh, switch off another light, because we are going to need this energy definitely in the future. Thank you very much.